is a continuation of the 1955 film. It depicts 1956 Arctic operations of the Military Sea Transportation Service, an invasion of the frozen regions of the North by convoys totaling 122 ships and encompassing the entire North American Arctic area. 1956 operations were divided into two major areas, with headquarters in New York and San Francisco. Separate phases provided the sea lifts for construction and resupply of the various bases, identified by code names, Sunek, Dewline, Mona Lisa, and the Pribilof Islands resupply. Although early exploration was conducted by numerous intrepid Arctic explorers, MSTS role in the Eastern Arctic began in 1950 with the sea supply for construction of bases in this area. This was originally called SUNAC, or Supply of North Atlantic Contractors. Under this program, huge Air Force bases were constructed at such sites as Thule and Goose Bay. Supply of all bases in this area was continued through 1956 under the revised code name SUNEC, or Supply of the Northeast Command. At the start of these operations in 1950, it was considered quite a feat to bring ships and supplies into these remote areas. Today, as a result of the experience gained by MSTS, these operations are considered as relatively normal point-to-point -point terminal operations. Shipping is scheduled into the ports in the Sunak area as soon as ice conditions permit, and operations are continued until the winter freeze-up period commences. Switching to the west coast, the supply of sites in the Alaskan area is called Mona Lisa. When MSTS was established in 1949, it inherited the resupply of these sites. A small supplementary operation supplies the Pribilof Islands. This is accomplished by one ship which carries supplies in and brings seal skins out. Project 572, or Dew Line, the distant early warning line of radar stations extends across the entire northern continent to provide advance warning of enemy air attack. It is the northernmost link in an electronic warning system which includes the Mid-Canada and Pine Tree Lines, radar picket ships, Texas Towers, and airborne early warning aircraft. Construction of the Dew Line was a joint United States-Canadian military civilian venture. Surveys began in late 1954. The sea lift started in 1955 and was continued in 1956. The Air Force was assigned responsibility for establishment and operation of these radar stations. They in turn assigned the Western Electric Company responsibility for design of sites and equipment, the purchase of all materials, and the contracting for construction of the sites. Western Electric, in turn, subcontracted the actual construction of these sites with civilian contractors, Puget Sound and Drake of Seattle, for all Alaskan sites, the Northern Construction Company, and the Foundation Company of Canada for all Canadian sites. When operational, dew line stations will be manned by civilian personnel provided under contract by the Federal Electric Corporation and operated by them under military supervision. The Military Sea Transportation Service was made responsible for movement of all cargo by sea. The Army was responsible for all cargo handling, its assembly, its loading into the ships, its offloading, and its delivery to the high water mark at the beach sites. In this role, MSTS operated in its usual manner as a point-to-point -point carrier, utilizing all required types of ships. Commissioned naval vessels, civil service manned, and civilian merchant ships manned by seamen of the American Merchant Marine. Canadian and United States Naval and Coast Guard icebreakers 
and other support ship. Army stevedores and their organic cargo handling equipment were transported to the offloading sites by MSTS ships, which also returned them to the continental United States, together with retrograde cargoes. Although the sea lift was planned as a standard MSTS operation, difficulties were imposed by the rigors of operation in Arctic areas. Navigation through uncharted waters, the shortness of the Arctic season, and weather and ice hazards. These factors pose operational problems which require careful planning to ensure the prompt and safe delivery of cargo at all sites and the safe return of all ships and personnel. Loading ports for POL were those along the Gulf and California coasts. The expression POL refers to all petroleum, oil, and lubricating products. General cargo was loaded at Norfolk, New York, and Boston on the East Coast. On the West Coast, cargo ships were loaded in San Francisco and Seattle. Support ships, consisting of icebreakers, command ships, amphibious types, salvage vessels, and other fleet types, were brought into the operation from bases at Argentia, Boston, Hampton Roads, San Diego, and Honolulu. Dew line operations were divided into three basic areas. The eastern sector, central sector, and western sector. Access to this eastern sector was from the Atlantic, through Hudson Strait into Fox Basin. Baffin Island sites were supplied by ships proceeding through Davis Strait. The western and central sectors were supplied by ships from the Pacific. These ships had to pass through Bering Strait, round the coast of Alaska, and get past Point Barrow. It is at this point that the most critical ice conditions prevail. Here the main polar ice pack grinds solidly against the coastline, except for short periods in late summer, when, under greatly hoped for favorable winds, it will move far enough offshore to permit passage. Ships proceed eastward along the Alaskan coast, dividing into units for cargo delivery to sites in the western area. Some ships continue on through Amundsen Gulf, Coronation, and Queen Maud Gulf, supplying central Canadian dew line sites along this entire route eastward to the Shepherd Bay area. The Mackenzie Bay area is supplied with POL and cargo which is moved overland and then out through the Mackenzie River system. This lift is conducted by the Northern Transportation Company of Canada. Long before the actual operation was scheduled to get underway, intensive preparations were begun to outfit assigned ships. In addition to standard cold weather operating procedures, ship's hulls were ice sheathed as necessary and standard propellers were replaced with high tensile special alloy propellers. The El Dorado, command flagship of Commander Task Group 5.1, was one of the ships arcticized in this manner. Her standard propeller was removed and replaced with a special Arctic propeller. Previous experience in Arctic and Antarctic operations demonstrated the need for this type of stronger propeller. Numerous casualties have been reported of sheared propeller blades as a result of working in ice. Installation of these stronger propellers has minimized such casualties. At the completion of advanced preparation, ships assembled at staging areas. The Western Task Group loaded at Seattle Army Terminal. Ships of the Eastern Task Groups were loaded at various East Coast ports. The principal ones were the Hampton Roads area and Brooklyn Army Terminal. Major use of LSTs in the Western Arctic was continued in view of their shallow draft and capability for offloading heavy equipment, as well as general cargo and POL, directly onto the beaches. The orderly flow of cargo to loading terminals and expeditious stowage aboard waiting ships was achieved through the close cooperation and coordination of the contractors, the military supply agencies, the Army stevedoring forces, and the Military Sea Transportation Service. 
flexible cargo stowage plans were carefully prepared in order to permit optimum discharge at the offloading areas. In many cases, a ship's entire cargo was discharged at one location. Frequently, however, along the due line, ships were required to offload at several different sites. Cargo was stowed to permit offloading at as many as three sites. Adequate provisioning of ships is just as important to the success of Arctic operations as is the cargo operation. Ships should carry sufficient provisions for the entire operation, since resupply of provisions is not feasible in Arctic areas. It should be remembered that the ration allowance for personnel in cold weather operation is increased 50%. Individuals burn up more energy in cold weather and require this increased ration. Landing craft were essential to the operation in many areas to provide lighterage between the deeper draft ships at anchor and offloading beaches. These LCMs, landing craft medium, were carried to the Arctic as part of the organic equipment required in offloading and handling cargo. Many of the landing craft were used for general cargo discharge, while others were fitted with fuel tanks for lighterage of bulk POL. These tanks, installed singly in LCMs, had a capacity of 6,000 gallons. Loading, provisioning, and departure of ships was planned on the basis of previous operating experience in the various areas. Departure plans were modified slightly to permit arrival of ships in the operational areas at the time considered best for ice transit and offloading. This was based on ice reconnaissance and forecast of ice and weather factors. Supply of the Sunek and Mona Lisa areas did not generally require a convoy-type operation. Ships were organized into convoys in the MSTS sea lift resupply all along the due line, both east and west. The task group commander organizes his convoys and issues instructions regarding departure, station speed, and station keeping. Good seamanship is a must in convoy operation. Keep your station. Maintain a good lookout. And check your running lights at night. En route to the Arctic, typical weather is encountered, including some heavy weather. Ships should be prepared for rough weather, battened down, cargo securely stowed, and all gear and equipment made fast. As the convoy nears the ice field, the seas moderate and ships may be closed up in a tighter formation in preparation for entering the ice. Once in the ice, speed is reduced, and time is available for the traditional ceremonies attending the crossing of the Arctic Circle. King Polaris Rex and his court sit in judgment on the invader of the North and subject him to tests that may qualify him as a blue nose. The full-fledged blue nose is now welcome in the Arctic, domain of the polar bear. As heavier ice is encountered, powerful icebreakers lead the ships through, opening a channel for the ice transit. Ships follow the icebreaker in designated order, which is governed by their type, size, power, and maneuverability. It is here that the principles of convoy operation in sea ice come into practical use. These are covered in other films. The character of the Arctic is typified by icebergs such as this, familiar sites in the eastern area. Remember, only one-seventh of this huge berg is above water. This is also true of sea ice. Arctic terrain is impressive. The eastern Arctic is characterized by deep gorges and precipitous slopes. Note how this icebreaker is dwarfed by the snow-covered hills around it. Along the Labrador and Baffin Island coastline, steep rocky cliffs rise abruptly from the sea. This wild and rocky terrain prevents the movement of supplies overland. Although access from the sea is difficult because of ice and navigational hazards, sea lifts provide the only acceptable mode of transportation. 
Steep underwater pinnacles rise from the ocean floor to near the surface along sea approaches to coasts of this nature. Piloting in this area demands extreme caution. Charted soundings indicate depths only where marked and may be misleading because unmarked areas cannot be assumed to have good water. Following a line of soundings is the accepted principle in areas such as this. Approaches to the beaches are steep and therefore ships offload by anchoring out in deep water and discharging into landing craft which ferry the cargo to shore. Anchorages are frequently in unprotected waters. Therefore, the weather must be carefully watched. Extreme and unusual formations are found throughout this area. Although most of the beaches in the eastern area are rocky and comparatively inaccessible, some locations provide beaches suitable for landing craft. Throughout this area, locations for site installations were frequently governed by the availability of usable beaches. West of Baffin Island, the terrain changes abruptly. Comparatively flat gravel beaches replace the rugged terrain to the east. West of Fox Basin, approaching Queen Maud Gulf, low gravel islands show the scars of glacial erosion. Landing beaches in this area are generally composed of large, coarse gravel. Further west, a site on the North Alaskan coast is located on low-lying tundra with a brook's range in the background. Lakes cover the landscape. Near the northwest tip of Alaska, flat tundra predominates. Sloping beaches in this area permit dry ramping of LSTs. The Arctic has its permanent residence, too. On hand to greet the advance units is the Queen of the North. This polar bear hit the jackpot with twins. At first, she showed some alarm at our intrusion, but then seemed to say, Yankee, go home. Walrus, mean and bad-tempered as they look, may weigh as much as a ton or more. Schools of white whales are frequently seen in many areas of the Arctic. Vast flocks of migratory birds return north each summer to lay their eggs and bring up their young. Musk oxen roam over the barren land to the far reaches of the north. When alarmed, they assume this stance for mutual protection. Wildflowers cover the area during the summer. Friendly, curious Eskimos are usually on hand to supervise operations. Comparative strangers to the Arctic are the ships of the task forces. These are the various types of ships. The El Dorado, an AGC, served as command ship for the Western Dew Line Task Group. The Staten Island, an AGB, a typical icebreaker of the wind class. The Requisite, an AGS, a survey ship. The Storis, a WAG, a Coast Guard survey ship. A Waggle, W-A-G-L, a Coast Guard buoy tender, used for inshore light ice breaking and general utility service. The LST, landing ship tank, carries organic stevedoring equipment and cargo for discharge through bow doors, directly onto the beach. The Simavi, C-1-M-A-V-1, a small shallow draft cargo ship, which carries about 2,500 tons of cargo in Arctic service. An AOG, a small T-1 tanker, which carries about 16,000 barrels of petroleum. The larger T-2 tanker was also used where depth of water permitted. A Victory, the larger and deeper draft cargo ship, extensively used in Eastern Arctic operations. Most cargo ships and tankers were civilian manned. An LSD, landing ship dock, used to transport lighterage and army stevedores from site to site. Her stern is flooded for launching or receiving lighterage. An LCU, landing craft utility, entering the flooded well deck of the LSD. The LCU was used to lighter heavy equipment, supplies, and POL to the beaches. 
and ARS, a repair and salvage ship. These ships provided valuable repair services and were indispensable in keeping ships fully operational. Assigned ships proved their worth throughout, operating successfully in pilot waters, in ice, and in bad weather. When fog was encountered, ships necessarily reduced speed. Fog, together with the added hazard of sea ice, occasionally halted transit. An interesting feature observed here is the fact that lighter concentrations of ice generally resulted in thicker fog. Conversely, when operating in heavier concentrations of ice, such as this, less dense fog occurs. However, heavier concentrations of ice can increase the possibility of damage to ships. Greater experience in Arctic operations has significantly decreased such ice damage. In fact, there was practically no major ice damage during 1956 operations. Even before arrival of the cargo ships and tankers, many technical and operational services were being conducted. Hydrographic surveys of the remaining uncharted waters involved were made by special Navy and Coast Guard survey ships. Extensive depth and current measurements were taken throughout the operational area. Bottom samples were obtained by means of a special coring device which yields a vertical core sample of the bottom, showing the exact composition to the depth of the core sample. Nansen bottles are used to obtain temperature and seawater samples at various depths. The advanced survey units set up navigational aids, such as radar reflecting beacons, sometimes with day markers attached. Their construction and navigational aid features varied according to needs of each area. Buoy and channel markers were laid where feasible. Aerial ice reconnaissance was another of the advanced services furnished to the task forces. Many long-range missions were flown by P2Bs to report ice conditions affecting the entire operational area. Later, when ships arrived in the area, R4Ds strategically based, flew daily medium-range ice reconnaissance in tactical support of the ships. Skilled ice observers in both P2Vs and R4Ds collect and evaluate data on ice condition. This information is transmitted to the ships to enable them to take the fullest advantage of reported ice condition. Aerial ice reconnaissance has proved essential and will be continued in future Arctic operations. Other aerial support was provided the task groups by helicopters, which were used to transfer personnel, equipment, and stores from ship to shore, and from ship to ship. All icebreakers, command ships, and LSDs are equipped with a helicopter landing platform. LSTs also serve as a base for helicopter operations. As ships traverse these hitherto uncharted waters, great dependence is placed upon the hand lead. In 1956, ice conditions in many areas required forcing of passage by icebreakers in order to reach the offloading sites. Ships followed in the path opened by the breakers. Frequently, ice conditions require a scattering of the convoy formation. While at other times, ships are able to steam in a tight single column formation. Distances between the ships are adjusted to meet varying ice conditions. Bell helicopters from the leading icebreaker ranged ahead to evaluate the ice situation confronting the convoy. This reported information enabled ships to take immediate advantage of open leads. Thus, even low-powered ships were able to make good time. Changing ice conditions require an alert lookout and immediate action to maintain station and avoid collisions. The ice transit doctrine is specified in the operational plan. This sets forth necessary procedures and signals. Great flexibility is incorporated in this doctrine 
to permit operation under varying ice conditions and in fog and inclement weather. Icebreakers at times operate independently when engaged in surveys and ice reconnaissance. These missions permit maximum use of the breaker's power. The Canadian breaker, Labrador, an old hand in the north, is maneuvered from her flying bridge. She proved an extremely valuable asset throughout the Eastern Arctic, an outstanding and versatile ship, capably handled by her skilled crew. Icebreaker's bows are designed to ride up on floating ice and break it by the weight of the ship itself. In this manner, they can break the ice varying from 10 to 15 feet thick. If the ice stops the breaker, it merely backs off and comes full ahead again. When escorting, even though the icebreaker itself could break through, progress is sometimes halted until ice conditions permit safe transit of the convoyed ships. At other times, ice may close in on the convoy and require the transit to be continued through increasing heavy ice concentration into areas of lesser concentration. Low-powered ships, such as this LSD, may at times become beset in ice and require icebreaker assistance to break free. The icebreaker comes close aboard and leads the ship to open water. Even after arrival at the offloading sites, ice conditions may present difficulties. In some of these areas, the anchorages may be congested with ice. At times, ships already at anchor may be forced to move out because of the influx of ice. Where offloading is an over-the-beach operation, the beaches must be prepared by underwater demolition team. These frogmen are specially trained and equipped to do the job, using small boats in the ice-filled waters along the beaches, taking soundings from the boat, measuring and recording the beach gradient, and checking for underwater obstructions to enable them to obtain complete beach intelligence information. When they locate an underwater obstruction that must be removed to make the beach usable, they place explosive charges and come ashore before detonating the charges to clear the area. Ships move into the beach areas after beaches are prepared. LSDs carried the landing craft and the beach cargo handling equipment. They also berthed and messed the Army stevedoring forces. Methods of offloading depended upon the character of the terrain in the various areas. In the deep waters along Baffin Island, ships anchored out as far as six or seven miles offshore and discharged into landing craft. Petroleum products had to be delivered in drums at some of these sites. This drummed POL was carried as general cargo aboard ships, such as the Victory ship, and offloaded into LCUs and LCMs. Crated general cargo was discharged in the same manner. Cargo operations continued even in adverse weather, which predominated throughout. Maximum advantage was taken of the few days of good weather. Cold weather cargo operations require that all machinery, gear, and equipment aboard ship be maintained in good working order to ensure optimum offloading and to avoid breakdowns, casualties, and delays. Most of the landing craft were equipped with two-way radios to expedite movement of cargo ashore. Beachmasters directed the beaching of landing craft. Dry ramping of the landing craft permitted comparatively easy offloading of cargo at the beach. At the same time, LCUs brought the heavier organic equipment ashore, such as this crane. Heavier palletized cargo was removed from the beach landing craft by crane. Unnecessary handling of cargo was avoided. It was placed directly aboard trucks or sleds for movement to the storage area at the high water line. All this organic equipment, the landing craft, the trucks, the tractors, cranes, and sleds, must be brought in, transferred from site to site, and carried out again by ships of the task group. Beach terrain is a major factor which limits the rate of cargo discharge. 
Beach composition varied from the smooth sloping silt beaches such as this to boulder strewn beaches where cranes on floating platforms were used to offload from LCMs. Standard palletized cargo containers shipped from continental United States as sealed units were placed on trucks for movement directly to the sites. Drummed POL was offloaded from the landing craft by cranes and in some areas, loaded directly on trucks. Along the Labrador coast, where sites were as much as 12 miles from the beach, this and the steep and rough terrain complicated cargo delivery. Movement and placing of fuel drums by tractor was necessary at beach sites such as this. Ducks and LVTs were used to transfer small items directly from ships to the site area itself. Ships in the Fox Basin area encountered offloading problems similar to those in other areas. The extreme tidal range from 35 to 40 feet caused considerable difficulty. The approaches to the beach were bulldozed clear at low tide. Only at high tide were landing craft able to beach for offloading. When the tide ebbed, they were left stranded, but offloading operations continued. The cargo was placed on sleds and hauled up the beach by tractors. These sleds, known as stone boats, were used throughout where use of wheeled vehicles was impractical. Further to the west, an abandoned landlocked coastal ship marks one of the beach sites. The same offloading procedures were used in the central sector with LCUs and LCMs dry ramping to discharge onto the beach. LCUs, as well as LCMs, provided a tight round-the-clock offloading shuttle service. Their army crews maintained a smooth running operation. Multiple discharge was possible along the relatively wide beaches in the central sector. Even though some scattered ice was grounded on the beaches, it presented no problem in this area. The same beaches were later used for POL discharge. The hose connection and pipeline runs from the shore to the beach tanks. Landing craft were also used to transport Army stevedoring personnel to and from the offloading sites. The stevedores, well-dressed in foul weather clothing, are ready to operate the various beach cargo handling equipment, tractors, cranes, and trucks. Meanwhile, an LST beaches nearby and begins discharging the heavy equipment which these Army stevedores will use. In no time at all, the crane is set up and carefully offloads drummed POL. On many beaches in this area, LSTs were able to dry ramp and discharge organic equipment and general cargo directly onto the beach. Cargo was stowed close by before being moved on up to the sites. One of the greatest difficulties in Arctic operations is beach ice that is piled up by the wind and current. In spite of the difficulties of ice, terrain, and weather, all cargo was successfully delivered. It was sorted according to type and consignee and carefully inventoried. Military responsibility for this due line cargo ended with its acceptance at the high water line. The POL that was transported in drums aboard cargo ships was stowed ready for use later in the year. Some of the general cargo carried during the previous season consisted of material for construction of POL storage tanks on the beach and at the sites. These were completed and ready to receive bulk diesel oil when the ships arrived. AOGs or T1 tankers discharged through offshore lines to the beach tanks. The POL was then pumped from these beach tanks up to the larger tanks at the site location. Where tankers were not able to get in close enough for direct discharge, LSDs carried tanker LCUs to these areas for use as petroleum lighters. These were specially equipped with two 15,000 gallon POL tanks and rigged for pumping. They were loaded alongside tankers anchored offshore 
and discharged their POL into the beach tanks. Where the beach gradient did not permit dry ramping, they discharged through an offshore hose. When the tanker LCU was able to beach readily, a simple connection was made to the shore fuel line, and the POL was pumped up to the beach tanks. Occasionally, POL discharge was accomplished through hose laid over the beached ice when the ice prevented actual beaching of the LCUs. Even LSTs were used to transport POL, carrying it in their wing tanks. They discharged through shorelines in the same manner. Training, such as this man overboard drill, was conducted as an integral part of the operation. Advance indoctrination was provided at staging areas covering operational plans, convoy procedures, cold weather and amphibious operations, cargo handling and damage control. Fleet and individual ship exercises and emergency drills were conducted wherever possible under actual Arctic conditions. Ample training material, training aids and films were available to all ships. Drills included fire and collision, abandoned ship and other emergency and damage control exercises as well as seamanship and operational procedures routine training in preparation for actual emergencies. Emergency exercises are coordinated to fully utilize all equipment, including helicopters, for recovery of a man overboard. A man cannot survive more than a few minutes in Arctic waters. Therefore, the speed of rescue by helicopter becomes vitally important. Helicopters have proved very effective in air-sea rescue work. The man overboard is picked up and returned to the ship quickly, where medical treatment would be provided. The operational plan included provision for salvage and repair facilities. Salvage ships, ARSs, provided valuable support and repair services. A civilian-owned LCM had to be salvaged in order to clear the channel into the beach area, where it was patched up, raised, and pumped out providing a practical salvage operational exercise. Although doctors and medical facilities were not provided in each ship, they were available with each unit, readily available to anyone in any area, to personnel of the Army, Navy, Coast Guard, civilian Marine personnel and contractors, even Eskimos if necessary. Personnel requiring treatment were hoisted smoothly aboard taken to sick bay for immediate medical treatment, and hospitalized if necessary. It was not all work and no play for personnel engaged in the operation. Mail delivery was provided for, and recreational film was exchanged between ships. There was shore liberty, too. Complete with refreshments and the afternoon baseball game. Rugged mountain climbing, with the summit as the goal. Even the amateur fisherman enjoys his sport. With cargo offloading completed, there is still much to be done. Retrograde cargo and beach cargo handling equipment must be loaded aboard ship. Landing craft again serve as lighters, this time from beach to ship. Heavy equipment such as cranes, tractors, trucks, and tank trailers were loaded aboard dry ramped LSTs, as well as aboard other ships of the task group. These gasoline trailers were used to provide interim storage of petroleum products during the early phases of construction and with the completion of the permanent storage tanks, are no longer needed. All retrograde cargo and equipment is securely stowed and lashed, ready for return to continental staging ports. In view of the difficulties and hazards of routing ships out through the ice barrier at Point Barrow, a preliminary survey of the Bellot Strait area was made near the completion of 1956 operations. If future surveys verify that there is sufficient water in Bellot Strait, and if ice conditions at Point Barrow so dictate, ships east of Point Barrow may be routed out Bellot Strait 
through Lancaster Sound, Baffin Bay, and Davis Strait to the East Coast. 122 ships were used by MSTS in 1956 Arctic operations. These included cargo ships, tankers, amphibious craft, icebreakers, and other support ships. Of these, 39 were engaged in the Sunek port-to-port -port resupply. 73 in the more difficult over-the-beach dew line operation, and nine in the Alaskan area Mona Lisa sector. The single ship used in the Department of Interior resupply of the Pribilof Islands discharged 5,000 tons of cargo and brought back $10 million worth of sealskin. In all, the 122 ships lifted a total of 220,000 measurement tons of cargo and 3,146,000 barrels of POL. Future MSTS Arctic operations are expected to be comparable to those of previous years. Cargo lifts will, of course, reflect the varying requirements placed on MSTS by the shipper services. Instructions for future Arctic operations will be provided in operational plans. For the 1957 resupply, the op plan covers the concept of operations, command relationships, hydrographic intelligence, and related information. It also provides plans for ice reconnaissance and ice transit, a hydrographic survey plan, supply and materiel instructions, cargo lift requirements, and operational procedures. A thorough knowledge of the op plan and application of its principles is essential to a successful operation. Personnel must be briefed on their responsibilities and prepared through instruction and training to carry them out effectively. This will include the proper outfitting and adequate provisioning of all ships assigned to the operation. Training support will be provided, including indoctrination in Arctic operations, task organization, damage control, convoy procedures, ice transit, cold weather operation, cargo handling, and seamanship. Training material, aids, and films will be furnished. Stowage plans must be prepared so as to provide for flexible cargo offloading. Convoy procedures and the ice transit doctrine must be thoroughly understood and followed by ship's officers. Proper station keeping is a must, particularly when operating in ice. All machinery, equipment, and gear must be properly maintained to ensure expeditious and safe cargo handling under adverse conditions and in cold weather. An operation in the Arctic is an all-hands job. These Arctic operations, combining Canadian United States resources and know-how, are vital to our joint national security. These dew-line stations are the final products resulting from this entire operation. Alert sentinels throughout the Arctic. Their resupply will be a continuing responsibility of the Military Sea Transportation Service. The Military Sea Transportation Service is proud to have played a major role in establishment of these Arctic outposts. Having provided the initial sea lifts and gained valuable experience in the Arctic, MSTS stands ready to meet all future requirements for Arctic Sea Transportation.